they do some common things in their business, but then a lot of things are not common, right? So everybody's kind of running their own business within a business. And so you don't get the consistency of result when by going from player to player. Some practitioners are really good and some are less so. All right. It is that time of the week. It is your favorite Tuesday I've had all week, and it is time for the True Wealth Radio Show. I'm your host, Dave Littlejohn, in studio with me today. Matt Dixon. Okay, Matt. Yes. Thank you for doing the prep work for the show today by not letting me see the prep work for the show today. I know. I only <laughs> printed one copy, so it's like, maybe it's the interview Dave it's, show. It's the, let's see how well Dave does on his toes day. Should be fun. Yeah, I'll, I'll walk <laughs> you through it. How about that? I love it. I love it. What, uh, what, what is the theme that's developing today? Yeah, I think... A lot of people kind of have questions around, you know, what maybe does a financial advisor even do, right? We know they deal with money in some fashion or another, um, but more than just that, it's talking, I think today about business owners or people that have a company or an entrepreneur of some sort, they look at this and they're like, how do I invest outside of my business? Most of the time, you know, people that have a business and are good at running a business, they know that landscape really well, but they might not know maybe some ways that they can save on taxes or, you know, invest in ways that allow the business to continue to grow, but also to put some potential money in their own pocket and employees' pockets. So I want to talk a little bit today to business owners and people who are even thinking about starting a business maybe okay. in the future. So business owners and entrepreneurs. Yeah. And what I heard sneaking between the lines of everything you just said was um, some people want to invest. A lot of people, they, the business is their investment. But what if you could reposition some money out of the IRS's account and back into your own. Yeah, especially, yeah. I mean, talking about what are some of the benefits of maybe opening a retirement account? We could kind of start there in really generic language and say, is a retirement plan a good idea? And Yes. Okay, okay next there we question. Go. <laughs> so um, could you talk to me maybe about some of the choices that are out there for someone who does have their own business and how those work? Okay, uh, yes. Uh, I feel like just for those listening to kind of help out though a little bit, you know, first consider, you know, maybe you're not a business owner. This probably is still interesting to you in that if you understand how the business made a decision, it may help you as an employee to kind of figure out like, why are they doing this? Uh, What's in it yeah. for me? I think we should talk about the flip side of this. Yes. If you're the employee and you're being offered this menu to choose from like, hey, I'm allowed to open this type of retirement account. That so, doesn't necessarily mean you can't open another type of retirement account on your own. Yeah. So again, backdrop for everybody here, because I don't assume that everybody knows what we're talking about yet, right? The, the challenge of living in the financial world is that we do this all the time. And I know you guys listening, not everybody does this all the time, right? So if you own a business, one of the things that now the state of Oregon pushes this to, right? They're, they're saying, we want to help people save. Right. And so they're encouraging businesses to open up or in certain cases, requiring businesses to create retirement plans. OK, which is kind of a weird thing. Um, it doesn't mean that the employer has to contribute to them, but it means that the employer is expected to create an environment where they exist. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's Oregon law. But I don't know what if you're listening in a different state, it may be different where you're at. But the point is. For entrepreneurs, first of all, a lot of the time we're trying to figure out ways to save on taxes. A lot of people don't understand that one of the things a business can do is create a benefit package for its employees, and you're able to expense that from the business. So it can be a retention tool for good employees. So creating benefits is a business expense, but it's also sort of an investment in your employees as an entrepreneur. Mm. Right. And now if you're the employee, you're like, huh, I guess maybe the boss is trying to keep me around by putting some things in place that are good for employees. Right. right? And, uh, you know, the number one thing that we most often hear about is what? Like an IRA of some sort? I think it's probably health insurance. Oh, 
right? I think that's what most people think of yeah. when they think of business benefits, right? Okay. They think of health insurance and maybe retirement plans. But small businesses in particular oftentimes don't offer health insurance because it is really expensive and doesn't scale particularly well. So, you know, if you have a business that's got a couple hundred employees, there's a lot of revenue running through that business because it's employing a lot of people. But the small mom and pop shop that's got maybe two to 10 employees, that can be very expensive for a small right. small business. So it's not uncommon for those not to be offered. But it's much more common to see retirement plans offered in small businesses and certainly in bigger businesses. So with that as a backdrop, let me ask you the question, Matt. Mm -hmm. Why might a business owner want, besides the employee retention concept, right. why might they want a retirement plan? I mean, they might want to be able, I mean, say, you know, the owner of the business is getting hammered on taxes, right? They're mm -hmm. just paying a ton. They're, they're, they have a lot of income. They might want to defer some of those taxes in order to not have to pay so much to the government yeah. in a given year. Yeah, it's true. Uh, we talk a little bit about taxes on this program, but not a ton. No. Right? Um, and, and that comes down to the fact that we're not legally tax advisors, but we can still talk about what taxes do and how they operate, right? Right. Um, taxes are a progressive thing. The more you earn, the higher your income tax goes. Right. Okay. So essentially the retirement plan, if you will, is a way to shift money and expense it out of the business and put it into a, some kind of retirement vehicle that defers taxes. If, if it's not a Roth, right? If we're talking about like regular retirement accounts, traditional like IRAs, traditional 401k. or a 401k is the really the, the one that we're kind of thinking of, but there's other types of mm -hmm. retirement plans, but they, they, they walk and talk similar to 401ks. Right. The idea is that the business can then expense out and rather than taking the, the income and paying taxes on it, you could put that income into a retirement plan and you don't pay the taxes until later. Why is that a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because you're saving for your future self while mm -hmm. also getting a little bit of a tax break today. Yeah. You're saving on the taxes now. That money that's not that didn't go away to taxes can now grow. Right. So mm -hmm. it's part of the investment, too. You're not yeah. having to invest with what's left after the taxes. You get the whole thing before the taxes. And then you get to let that grow over time. And as it grows, you don't pay taxes on the growth. Right. So mm -hmm. you're not experiencing capital gains. You're not paying dividend taxes or any of those things as you're accumulating. When do you pay the tax? In retirement, when you go to pull the money out. Right. And and we assume retirement. It's, yeah, I mean, you but could, it's in the future. You could pull it early. Yeah, you, right. No. And what happens if you pull it too soon? Well, you depending on what type of account, you know, most of the time there's a 10% tax penalty. Or uh, more. Or more. Yep. There, there's ways that it can go higher than that. But then you also pay that as income. So right. if you had $70,000 of income for the year, but then you pull 30000 out of that retirement account, ooh, now you have $100,000 of income for the year, and you paid the 10% penalty or higher right. on, the, on 30, the withdrawal. Yeah. So there are some gotchas to it, but the benefit would be, especially if you're working today and you have a bunch of income, right, that you have more money or higher tax rate now, and then later on in the future, you expect a lower tax rate. Me too. So the lower tax rate in the future is what we're really trying to shift things back. toward. I love you too, Amber. <laughs> Hi, Amber. <laughs> we have a, a visitor in studio. <laughs> oh, yes, we're live. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> so now you know, right? Um, so at any rate, uh, you know, back to the train of thought, right? Right. The, the whole purpose is like, hey, if I'm in a high tax bracket today, but in my, in my retirement, I'm not going to be earning as much and things are paid for and I don't have to take all of my money out all at once, I can shift money into a lower tax bracket in the future. So I'm getting several benefits at once, right? Mm -hmm. Lowering my immediate tax rate, increasing the amount that I'm saving and growing into the future, and I'm pushing it into the future in a lower tax rate. Well, and here's something that that business owner might not be thinking about. Here's a couple of things. Uh, one, it might not cost you as much as you think to have employees be part of that plan. 
right? Mm -hmm. So say you set it up to where they're getting 3% of their pay. It might not cost you as much as you think, number one. Um, you could potentially have it set up to where they're not eligible for mm -hmm. that retirement plan for a certain period of time. So before they even start getting contributions, well, you know, they've got to wait a little bit. So right. that might incentivize that person to also stay there longer and be with the company less yeah. turnover potentially. Sometimes golden handcuffs are a useful thing. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, and you know, you don't have to have a business full of employees, right? If you have your own business and it's an, a business of one, there's still options out there for you, even if you're the only person in the business. So that's an interesting one because a lot of people don't realize that as the business owner, you get to wear two hats. You're the employer mm -hmm. and the employee, uh -huh. right? I think most folks yeah. that work for somebody else, uh, they're used to wearing the employee hat. Right. And so they're sort of presented with the terms as to what they're going to get. Right. You know, here's the types of benefits that we have or don't have. Here's the pay structure that you have. Here's sort of what the assigned work is. And this is how we get it done. And there, there's a structure to that employment. The employer, though, they have to figure out what's what is the right structure. Right. What can the business bear? What does it need? How does it, you know, how is it going to utilize this tool? Uh, oftentimes it's driven by the needs of the business owner, but not exclusively. True. Right. And especially the larger the business, the more that it's driven by the the needs of the employees. Right. right. And there's different types of retirement plans out there, too. So one might not be the perfect fit, but then you explore another option. You're like, hey, this one sounds like it really might work for me. There's so many different options anymore. Exactly. And so and we and there's there's so many more nuances to the benefits, too. Right. Uh for the sake of not boring our listeners to death, yeah. here, here's here's kind of the key takeaway. Businesses can expense business benefits. And those benefits, because they're being expensed, becomes more tax efficient. And you then have opportunities to work with. This is what a lot of financial planners are working with, and a lot of financial consultants, even insurance folks. What they're trying to do is try to reposition money within the business to be more tax efficient. Can you kind of talk about what that tax efficiency looks like? Like how, like, so yeah, they're giving some money to employees to their retirement account. How does that really affect their taxes? Do we want to get into the weeds on that? So let's discuss after Ooh, this tricky, important tricky important profit break. Stick around. We'll be right back. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. And you got True Wealth on News Radio 929 FM at 1240 KQEN. Hey gang, welcome back to the Shoe Wealth Radio Show. I'm your host, Dave Littlejohn, in studio with... Matt Dixon. And if you were just joining us, you have missed out on the first incredibly important segment for business owners and entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. which is, you know, sort of step one of understanding how businesses can expense certain benefits to the benefit of the employer and employee. So grab our podcast. Do it. Right? So go to uh, littlejohnfs.com and you can catch the podcast. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel and you get it in little bits and pieces because mm -hmm. that's how we do it. Right. Right. Uh, and it's also a great chance if you have questions or things that you would like us to answer live, then it's a great source of content for us is uh, what is it that you would like to hear about? And so Absolutely. Uh, send, send us an email, info at littlejohnfs.com, and we can uh, uncover some more fun. Matt, I understand today a lot of what we're trying to do is help folks kind of understand, like, why do I necessarily work with a financial advisor? And what are some right. of the things? And so we start with this entrepreneur concept of advisors help custom design like that's one of the things we do as planners. We work with entrepreneurs to help them design benefit packages in some cases and optimize mm -hmm. them for their business. Right. Okay. That, that's a big piece. Um, some other stuff that I kind of wanted us to chat about too. And you just mentioned it. What is it that a financial advisor can do or bring to the table? And what are some of those circumstances where it's like, maybe at this juncture, I should seek out some help mm -hmm. because when you hear financial advisor, that doesn't well, mean a whole lot yeah, right? yeah. inherently. Maybe before we jump down that path, I'm going to Shanghai it for a second and, and um, ask you a couple questions. There's a lot of folks out there that refer to themselves as financial consultant, financial advisor. Mm -hmm. What, what do you think goes into this? Like there's this spectrum. What, 
Who yeah. are the people that are calling themselves financial advisors? Well, and what I think do you need that's to know? one of the problems in the industry right now, right? Like a lot of people might kind of claim that they're a financial advisor, but you don't really know what service set that they're offering. Maybe someone just manages assets. So they sit there and they say, oh, you want to invest? All right, we can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, hand some money over and I'm going to just do stuff with mm -hmm. it. And you're like, okay, well, maybe, maybe that person wants more, right? Like maybe they have an estate. So they have a house and retirement accounts and a pension and social security. And they've got a lot of different pieces going on. And they're like, I need to know how all of these work with each other and how, how do I manage this whole thing, not just manage this money. So let me sum this up for you in a word. Sure. Scope. Yeah. Okay. No, not the mouthwash. I mean, scope, like what is the spectrum of services that an advisor is offering? Because right. I think you just correctly identified uh, in there sort of a question to the, that people should ask is, what does my financial advisor do? And what am I looking for them to do? Exactly. It's a really loaded question, right? It really because is. Because I heard an advertisement on the radio the other day. And, you know, the, it was a bank talking about how they're a fiduciary. And if you want them to actually take authority over your assets when you pass, they can step in and actually, like, become the trustee for sure. your trust. Sure. Which, that's a whole different scope of, you know, right. of management. And so, there's so many different avenues that a financial advisor or a fiduciary can take, which is just a fancy way of saying... Uh, an advisor who is legally obligated to work in the best interest of the client, which I think that's important, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because not everyone carries that standard. They can do things that are in the best interest of them. I As will. I'll be careful with that one, right? Right, and just because I do want to defend the profession at large here, right? Yeah, fiduciary is a legal standard. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so when you're working with fiduciaries, there's a legal obligation to put the client's best interest first. Right. right. Now, when you talk about uh, financial advisors that maybe don't have a legal obligation to be a fiduciary, many still act as if they are. Oh, absolutely. Right? And right. so they are still attempting to operate in the best interest of their customer. The, the question is whether or not they have the legal obligation to, because there is a difference in terms of the standard of care associated, right? right. Do you have uh, a, a fiduciary obligation or do you have a suitability obligation? That's right. actually, they sound similar, but they're not the same thing. Can you thing. talk about that a little bit? Well, suitability means that it's acceptable for the client, right? right. Um, the example, that this is always an extreme, right? But let's say that you had two scenarios that were otherwise identical, but one pays a commission to uh, a financial professional, the other one does not. And the long-term difference is that the commissionable product has higher internal fees. You would expect over time that those higher internal fees would erode the customer's performance experience. And so when given the ability to sell a lower fee structure or the higher fee structure, both would be suitable for the customer and that neither is going to harm them, one would be considered more suitable from a fiduciary perspective, but they're not obligated to select the more suitable. They're obligated to select the suitable one, which can mean that there are times that there could be financial incentives that would otherwise eh, perhaps cloud the judgment of the financial professional. Mm. I think it's important that you talk about this, though, right? Oh, you, you should, right? And and I'm also really quick to defend. Just because somebody operates under a suitability standard doesn't mean they are not choosing what they believe right. genuinely to be in the best interest of their client. I think that the lion's share of practitioners are trying to serve their clients well. I just don't think all of them are. That's the problem with any industry, right? Mm -hmm. Is that it, it only takes a handful of bad actors to tarnish the reputation of an entire well, industry. And that's why the regulations these days are so tight and so sure, stringent. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I think these are questions that people should ask. So what is my financial advisor? What is the scope of the engagement? What can I expect? I, I'm really convinced that the industry is not pinned down what expectations are. Right. It's really ambiguous. Mm -hmm. There's sort of a minimum expectation that we have to give them statements. Right. Right. You know, there's certain reporting that has to happen. But 
in, in terms of how businesses operate, there's a tremendous amount of difference from business to business so, in terms of how they engage with their customers. I'm going to interview you for a second. So oh you said that there's a lot of variation in this field. What are, you know, you set this company up and you've designed it to be and feel a certain way. Yeah. What really, maybe not separates, but what are some things that you kind of think are unique to Little John Financial that might be Maybe I know this is going to sound like you're bragging on air for a second, but kind of sets you apart where you feel like you might differentiate yourself from a more generic company that is just going to manage the finances. Sure. Well, maybe to answer that, and you know, I get bashful about this stuff, right? We've been doing this radio show for a long time, and we try not to turn it into a sales pitch, right? My my yeah. take on this has always been that good education for our listeners is exactly that, and if the needs of our customer aligns with what we offer, mm -hmm. then it's a good fit. But I just want to help teach people to do this because I'm convinced you can do this yourself. It's just a lot of people don't, won't, can't. There's lots of reasons for it. So then you need somebody that you can trust. So with that as the backdrop, right? Then why was this firm created, right? First was because uh, having operated in some other firms, I found that there were a lot of internal rules that were designed to protect the business more so than the customer. Okay. And I just felt like that was a little bit misaligned. Uh, second, I find that a lot of other firms are designed to accumulate lots of representatives of the firm, but all of those representatives, they do some common things in their business, but then a lot of things are not common, right? So everybody's kind of running their own business within a business. And so you don't get the consistency of result when, by going from player to player. Some practitioners are really good and some are less so. Yeah. Right? And so I think what, what I was shooting for with, with our firm, with, uh, with Little John Financial was uh, a more consistent experience for the customer. And the biggie for me was I didn't want internal competition for customers. Mm -hmm. Okay. I felt like that was a disservice to the client was to create a your client, my client env environment where people were competing for the same customer. So it, we built a team practice. Right. Right. And I think that was a huge differentiator in philosophy that says, well, who, whenever a customer calls, they are who we exist to serve. Right. So that was just the, the first and foremost is, well, let's know who our customer is. Let's know what rings the register for us. Next, it was let's make sure that we as closely as we can align our incentives so that we win because our customer wins. Right. right. As opposed to we win regardless of whether or not our customer wins. That didn't seem like the right alignment. So that's why we are primarily when it comes to our asset management, we're a fee only firm. Can't say we're fee only because we have an insurance branch as well that can offer insurance to customers. Uh, we don't do it a whole lot, but it's available. And because that's a regulated product, there's a commission structure to it. Mm -hmm. We can't really strip that out in many cases. So. Uh, we can't say that we're fee only because if we do insurance and you do a handful of contracts a year, then, you know, it, it means that we're in conflict with that. So we are fee based. But our asset management, when we say fee only, think of it this way, right? We charge a percentage of the total account that we're managing for our customer. Okay. Okay. And rather than having a transactional expense associated, so whenever we buy or sell something, we get a commission for it. It doesn't, we don't get a, in any kind of compensation for buying and selling. And a lot of, would you say there's still, you know, definitely a handful of firms out there that operate it's, that it way? It still exists because a lot of mutual funds are still built that way. Right. They're designed to pay some kind of commission structure. And then there's a residual fee that's paid sort of in later months or years back to the it, it, firm it, that to yeah. yeah essentially to the the representative it's to service accounts right so there's a reduced fee on the back end that comes back it's called a CDSC or a contingent well the contingent deferred sales charge is a, sa a sale penalty if you if you get out early but they have what they call 12b1 fees mm. 12b1 fees are those residual fees that are collected out of the operating expense of the fund and they're paid to the, the and you're saying that's not something that little john really we don't yeah. we don't charge trail fees on anything because we're not buying with commissions right we're buying yeah. it wholesale we do charge a fee for service 
but that's to stay aligned, right? And here's, let's just kind of use easy math. These are not necessarily real numbers, but let's just use your easy math. Um, let's say a client has uh, uh, half a million dollars that we're managing for them. Okay. And just to keep the math easy, let's say that we charge 1% per year. Okay. Okay. So 1% of a half a million dollars, it's $5,000, mm -hmm. right? If we can grow the account to a million dollars, then we would win with the customer. They have twice as much money. We're getting paid twice as much too now because we have 1% of a million dollars instead of half a million dollars. Mm -hmm. So our interests are aligned. If the account shrinks, we you don't want to stop paying. This is a really hard one, by the way. People think, well, why don't I only pay if they're making me money? Okay, this is this is actually a super important question. I'm looking at the clock. I want all of you guys listening to stick around for the answer to this question, which is, should I pay my advisor when the markets are going down? Mm. Very important answer to that might surprise you. I'll tell you right after this break. Stick around. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. And you got True Wealth on News Radio 93.9 FM and 1240 KQEN. All right, gang, welcome back to the True Wealth Radio Show. Dave Littlejohn on in studio with... Matt Dixon. And I promised we would answer a really interesting question. You should catch the podcast if you're just uh, joining us today. We're talking a little bit about fee structure. We're specifically talking about what makes Little John Financial a little bit different, which mm -hmm. I don't normally talk about because I'm not too into like major promo of our firm. I get it. So yeah, I, I don't throw the even phone think it's up. a promo. I think it's just informing people, hey, you know, we might be a little bit different than the next guy. And you need mm -hmm. to know that because we might not be the right fit for you. Right. But then again, maybe yeah. it is perfect. And by the way, there are other fee-based or fee-only advisors around. Oh, yeah. Right? So so we're not it, right? Nope. Um, but we have our way of doing things, and, and we like it. But but nevertheless. And if you don't like it, kick rocks now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and find somebody you do like. You know, that's how that goes. <laughs> and kick rocks. Um, all right. Why? My, the question, the loaded, very loaded question is, uh, in a fee only or a, a fee based asset management scenario where you're getting a percentage, like I said, the advisor is charging a percentage of the assets they're managing. Mm -hmm. It is often asked to me, why should I as a customer pay the advisor if the account is going down, mm. right? I understand that the account makes money, we both profit because, you know, hey, I made money, so you should make money too. But if I'm losing money, a lot of people say, then shouldn't you be losing money? Right. And and what I would suggest is the advisor is being paid less, so they feel the impact. The business is very aware of this impact. But what could potentially go wrong if you only paid your advisor when you made profits? Well, I'll ask this question. Wouldn't the advisor just want to take on more and more risk? Because if you're not getting paid when you're losing, wouldn't you just want to ratchet up the risk and try and get you know, super high returns. And I don't know, like, want or not, but wouldn't that be the incentive, right? Yeah. Because you're like, well, look, if I guess wrong and you don't make money, okay, I don't make money anyway. But if I guess right and you make some money, I get paid. Right. So you kind of disincentivize risk management. It's like telling a baseball player in the major leagues, you know, Basically, you're only going to get paid if you hit home runs. Well, he's going to swing like crazy every time he steps up to the plate, yes. and he's going to only he's going to swing at almost everything. Yeah, if it could be a home run ball, may as well. You yeah, know, because if there's no penalty, it's like look, it'd be different if you're you said swing at every you're going to get paid for home runs. Yeah, but you're not, you know, and you'll get paid for base hits too, right? Like, yeah, it, it's kind of but one of those you lose you your said, entire paycheck if it's a walk. Well, <laughs> yeah, I, mean? I sort of say like. You don't get paid if you strike out. That would be the better one, right? A walk actually still gets you on base. That's that's a, that's playing it smart, right? Mm -hmm. But if you, what's the difference? You only get paid to make home runs or you don't get paid if you strike out. There's a difference. One of them is going to be more defensive in nature. They're going to go for high percentage shots. And th that's the thing about investing is like a lot of folks, you know, there's different philosophies. It's like, well, look, I'm going to take 20 bets and one of them is going to be a home run and it's going to make up for the 19 losers. We don't prescribe to that theory, just so you guys are aware. Yeah. Right. It is about um, long term diversification value. And there's a lot of risk management strategies associated. And you know why? Easy answer. 
Like, why should you manage risk? Because sometimes clients need to take money out and you don't want your account to be way down when you need to access that the money. That is so true. Yeah. Right. That's sometimes a, that's, you need the money. And so if you are. Yeah. Risk, wouldn't you rather take yeah, money it, out when the markets are up? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, for sure. You definitely don't want to wait until like how uh, the most recent example, like 2019 going into 2020, March of 2020 markets fall like 30 something percent in weeks, mm -hmm. right? Two, three weeks, everything just collapses. What if you had to move? And you had to take a big withdrawal from your investment accounts once th you get 30% less purchasing power at that right. moment. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I think I'm glad you brought this up because I actually hear this question all the time. People are like, is it a good time for me to take some money? And I do often say, hey, let's take a look at, you know, where is the account? And oh my goodness, you're up $50,000 this year. Go ahead and take $20,000 okay, out. Unless you like have 500 million and be like, well, you're barely making anything, right? Right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so remember, numbers should always have context. That's another one that I would That's tell you true. for any financial advisors out there. It's like, make sure the numbers have context because mm -hmm. there's three kinds of lies in the world, right? There's lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. I, and I've seen that, you know, where someone's like, hey, you know, I'm down $100,000. And it's like, you have a $3 million account. Like, that's a normal... Yeah, yeah we call that months. Tuesday, yeah. right? It's just, it's it's a... Percentage wise, it's not significant to the total volume of the account. Exactly. Uh, it's like, you know, if the diving board is six inches long, it, it, you know, it doesn't move much. But when it's 60 feet long, a one degree move translates mm -hmm. to a, a big fluctuation on the end of that board. Right. right. And that's yeah. what big accounts look like is they just it's bigger moves. Mm -hmm. And then it's always funny, too. And that person's like, well, you know, my account's up 12 percent, but the S&P is up 13. And it's like, <laughs> Yeah, it's a one percent difference, but well, it, it it does add up over time. Um, but this again is one of those the idea that well, it's when people aren't measuring the same way each time. It's like, yeah. oh, I'm looking at this loss. Well, that's half a percent, and then they go and then they change it, and then they start looking at percentages when it's time to evaluate performance yeah. instead of dollar amounts. You're up one million dollars this year well i really wanted to be up 1.1 1 .1. and it's like i it's the I tyranny it, of absolute versus relative yeah. return right like yeah. on an absolute basis here's the dollars that i gained or lost right on a on a percentage basis or relative basis i'm up this much or i'm yeah. this percentage or that percentage or down that percentage. well it right. all is based on when you're measuring it too i was looking at some performance numbers today mm -hmm. and it it absolutely blew me away. I changed the calendar dates by like 20 something days. Mm -hmm. And the percent return on this one thing I was looking at went from like seven to 10. And right. I'm like, so if you had measured, you know, 20 days into the cycle past when it started, your numbers wouldn't look that great. But yeah. you add the last couple weeks of that in there and it's like now it looks awesome so yeah. you can really manipulate the numbers by changing the dates and that's the thing it's it's hard to do also like i don't see performance reporting done this way um, i've worked in some softwares that does this a little bit but it's interesting if you were to take a rolling average return in an account Okay. We do this a lot in the advisory landscape. When you're doing investment research, you might say, well, I want to see a 200-day moving average of the price of a stock. And what you're doing is just saying, well, here's the average price for the last 200 days. And tomorrow, I'm going to take the oldest day off, and I'm at the new day in, and I'm going to take a new average. And I'm going to plot that over time, and it sort of smooths out the ups and the downs. Mm -hmm. And so a 200-day price average, you can see, well, here's the current price compared to the last 200 days. We call that a 200 day moving average or maybe a 50 day moving average or a 10 day moving average. But it's it's a way to get a sense of how is the stock moving, not moment to moment, but over a period of time. But you don't see people measure their performance that way very often. They typically look at a calendar year and say, well, show me January 1 to December 31 and show me that snapshot. And that's how I decide if it's working or not. Mm -hmm. That's largely what the mutual industry, mutual fund industry does. And it's where a term called window dressing comes from. Tell right? me about window dressing. Window dressing is essentially trying to set the system up so that the numbers look good for a calendar basis. And so you see shuffling things around late late November, early December, to try to position so that uh, a, a mutual fund number looks good on at the end. So, it's, so it's, you're saying like, as an example, maybe a mutual fund manager 
is in November, and they're way above the target where they wanted to hit for the year. They're or, like, or to get a bonus, perhaps. Maybe they are they're bonused against how they perform against a benchmark. Right, and so if they're crushing the benchmark, they could, in theory, basically, you know, if the agreements of the mutual fund allow for it, they could reposition assets around to lower their risk exposure and try and lock in that gain. They could the potentially, or here's another one. Let's suppose that they're not going to hit their bonuses. They take on more risk? Well, they don't necessarily, but they can do things like they can distribute a bunch of their adverse capital gains just to get it out of the way, right? Because mm. there's an interesting thing about the way mutual funds operate where they can choose when they declare their capital gains or losses, right? So they don't declare a loss. They're never going to make a loss. Oh, so you're version. saying if they're going to end but up missing they'll just say, it. I'm going to just, yeah, I'm going to miss anyway. Then let's get this toxic stuff off the books to set up a better next year. Oh, so they might liquidate. It's possible. Yeah. It's possible that yeah. something like that could happen. You'd have to look at the prospectus. and uh, But but if you've got a whole bunch of embedded capital gains and you're not going to hit stuff anyway, you, then you, you, know, you just rip the Band-Aid things. off and, and you know set yourself up so that the next year can look better. Mm. It's it's potential out there. And then there. maybe even rebuy it if it's a position that they still like. Sure. Yeah. They, they could potentially change their, their basis and do tax management within the, the fund. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't happen often. I, like, I don't think this is a, an abused scenario, but it's not impossible. Right. Right. And so those are just elements that happen when you're in a, in a managed product like that. Right. right. It's that a, a, gain, a capital gain distribution could occur and it's outside of your ability to control the And timing. that's not to say that all managed products are bad, right? No, no, because we're not. It's just a feature yeah. of managed. But there's other features of managed product that are kind of handy. Like you right. could, uh, you know, you have your own capital gain of when you buy or sell it, but they may never distribute a gain to you. So you could have some tax efficiency because they're taking in new cash. And mm. so they're rebalancing their portfolio with the new cash from new investors, which means that you may actually experience increased tax efficiency. In some Ooh, scenarios, double-edged sword. Yeah, yeah. so uh, it, it can work out nicely uh, in that respect. But um, all of this to get back to the idea that um, when you're, well, I, I think I kind of even lost some of the original <laughs> idea. We just started going down the mutual fund path so much. Um, oh, the moving average. That's yeah. really what it came down to. It's like, well, if you're looking at how well your returns are, uh, I think you're better off saying, well, here was my January to January, February to February, March to March, April to April, and then take, take a look at how that evolves over time. That gives you a sense of how stable your portfolio is and what your actual rolling return looks like. Okay. Yeah. And again, not common to do. Most people just take a 12-month snapshot of what they were doing previously and maybe a three-year snapshot and kind of go, well, here's the trend and here's how, how we're looking. You know, one thing we didn't do? No. We didn't talk to our listeners about kind of some of the stuff that we do internally that might be different than other places. Oh, goodness. Well, yeah. All right. We promised Matt, it. We, we promised, promised it. All right. So Matt's going to tell us more after our last break. All right. Okay. Stick around. If you want to know what makes, like these guys on the radio, they got an investment firm. I'm kind of curious. What do they do? What do they do and how are they different? Just a little bit more when we come back. Stick around. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. And you got True Wealth. Yeah, we'll do that. News Radio 93.9 FM at 1240 KQEN. And we are back. Welcome back to the True Wealth Radio Show. Dave Littlejohn in studio with Matt Dixon. Matt what did you what do our list you promised our listeners yeah okay lay it on me okay so when we left off at the break we were talking about what are some ways that little john financial kind of specializes in what are some of those avenues where it's like that's kind of an area where they're really comfortable and familiar with and so diet sodas unfortunately <laughs> i won't drink them i can't i can't do it um i love my real sugar pepsis as david will know um but no okay getting back on track so david do you want to start us off just give me one short little thing where because i'm actually i'm gonna throw you on the spot what's something that you think we do well something i think that we do well yeah. Uh, I think we're pretty high touch with our customers. Like we oh, don't great. even have a phone tree. Like if you call, you mm -hmm. either get a person or you get a voicemail that like we all get 
harassed by and you get called back usually within moments right so yeah. so you almost always get a live person to answer the phone and we don't do phone tree on purpose i don't even know that that, that is a good one that's not really where my brain was at so oh okay more See of that? like some of the areas where it's like when we're doing business it's like hey that's something or that's a person that we tend to help right so like i'm looking at this and saying matt What's the answer you're looking for? Okay, I'll give you one. <laughs> I'm going to give you one and see if you can yeah. keep this He's going. He's trying to lead the way to something like, well, go ahead. Just, you know, yeah. go for it. Okay, so I think one of the areas where I think we do well, um, you have a spouse that's passed away, right? And yeah. you, didn't, you didn't really know maybe kind of how everything was invested. It just wasn't your area of expertise. I think we do inherently a pretty good job of bringing that person in and saying, hey, you know, we don't want to talk over you. We want to be able to get you kind of up to snuff with what it is that we do, why we do it. And does that make sense for your journey? Yeah. Because sometimes it doesn't. And it's like, hey, this isn't a good fit. But I think we do a good job communicating and coming up with ideas of how to help that person who has gone through a tragedy, needs a plan, needs someone that they feel comfortable with, and kind of walking that person through what the next steps are. Yeah. Uh, sadly, I think you're right. And sad only because, um, you know, when folks are going through challenging yeah. times like that, I think a lot of it just comes down to, again, it's pretty personal. And our culture is not big mega business right now. It's no. very um, personable. And so because we try to know all of our customers like by really name, well, yeah, it's like yeah. you're not just a number. Yeah. We know who you are. And and so, yeah. I, I mean, it's interesting, too, because we not everybody qualifies to be a client. No. Right. And and that's not because we're trying to be uh, uppity about things. It's because the people that we've made commitments to, our first, our first obligation is to them. So before mm -hmm. we take on new obligations, we have to make sure we can meet the existing obligations. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we're, we spend a great deal of time. I think there's a, a compassionate side to us, but there's also a lot of education. So people will come in and they don't have a good knowledge base. And so we, we try to build that knowledge base up so mm -hmm. they can be confident in what we're doing. And then we work together on it. I mean, speaking about the education piece, mm -hmm. the other area I think, you know, we kind of dive into a little bit is for the person who has maybe multiple income sources and is getting close to retirement. Um, and they're trying to look at all the different pieces of the puzzle and say, how do they all fit together? And they need someone that can analyze what are all the different pieces that I've got going on in my life? And then what is the plan moving forward? Can I retire right now? Um, where should I start accessing money from in retirement? A lot of people don't know. They have maybe right. five or six different areas where they could access money, but they don't know what the most tax efficient way to access money is is and sure, so they sure. they show up and they say hey walk me through this yeah i would say that is it goes into strategic planning okay now these yeah. are terms that get tossed around a lot but strategic plans like you need a strategy to be efficient and so the idea is well let's look at all the moving parts that you're working with and then let's figure out an optimized way to deal with them right yeah uh, and that's just highly personal you can't kind of give that advice on the radio because everybody's circumstance is unique mm -hmm. and their needs are unique but our, our the idea would be that you sync up by understanding what they're working with and what their goals are, and then developing a strategy to optimize what they're trying to do. So, yeah, I, I, and, and, you know, it, it generically falls under the term planning, right? It, but planning is pretty nondescript. And so mm -hmm. that, that's my frustration. Our industry, because of regulation, waters a lot of terms down. And, you know, what are we really trying to do for our customers? Look, you worked really hard. To, to, to scratch together what you have over a lifetime. Let's not screw this up, right? right. So let's not unnecessarily give it to the government. Let's not um, like mischaracterize the way we manage our taxes and overpay where we don't need to. I think I just said the same thing twice. Um, let's not, uh, I guess, be frivolous or uh, and, and accidentally make an unforced error that costs us, right? right? That's that's one of the things that we see a lot. And so there's just a lot of things that, that come down to efficiency and in the plan B stuff, mm -hmm. right? You know, hey, we, we got to make sure that we got, if it's not going to me, who, where's it go? And how do right. we, how do we do that stuff the right way? So I, I just think that there's, there's so much, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's funny, but the money management, that is secondary to the planning for us. Mm -hmm. It's the thing that, 
wags the dog at the end of the day. But if you if you have a lousy plan, you know you blow up, you know a whole lot of money in a hurry. So right. you got to start with the good fundamentals. I think that's just where we're at. Okay. Well, there was so much more on the list, David, but I don't know that we've got time for it. No, we got like 18 seconds or something. Okay. So let's just leave it at this. Um, how do folks reach us if they have a need? It's super easy to go to littlejohnfinancial.com. So littlejohnfs.com and uh, chat us, give us a call. We're easy to find. Yeah. It's true, all the best. So give us a chat when you can. And um, also, you know, consults are free. So if, if we can help or we can get your point in the right direction, that's what we want to do. But we're out of time for now. So until next time, I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. You've been listening to True Wealth on News Radio 93.9 FM at 1240 KQEN.